Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, um, we're kicking off 2018 with a talk on Kubernetes 1.9, the features, functions, and futures. Um, Derek Carr is our guest speaker today, and we're going to have a lot of content, so I'm not going to talk very long. I am going to mention that um, we are hosting another OpenShift Commons gathering in London on January 31st, so go to commons.openshift.com. Dot org if you want to find information on that. Um, but with that and no further ado, I'm going to let Derek take it over and we're going to drive through um, all of the goodness of Kubernetes 1.9. So thanks, Derek. All right. Well, thank you, Diane. Um, hopefully everyone had a refreshing uh, holiday break. Um, what I want to go through uh, today was uh, all the great work that was done just in time for Christmas for uh, Kubernetes 1.9. I'm going to try to uh, give a summary across uh, the entire ecosystem of, of what got accomplished. Uh, just so for folks that are aware, I mean, my background on the project uh, is, is long and storied, but um, uh, these days I focus a lot on uh, particular areas around the node and resource management. So uh, I'll do my best to answer any follow-on questions in areas that might not be out of my particular domain, but... Um, uh, uh, feel free to ask anything uh, that you want further clarification on afterwards. So with that in mind, um, what's new this time around in Cube 1.9? So uh, let's pull together some of the stats and uh, I was a bit amazed here to be honest. Uh, this was a shorter release uh, Cube 1.9, so always the fourth quarter release of Kubernetes um, is a bridge due to the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. Um, and what impressed me is when looking at the stats across all of the pull requests that get merged across the entire Kubernetes organization, 6,000 plus pull requests are still a lot of pull requests. And even in that time, there were something approximately like 75,000 comments across pull requests and issues. So uh, just looking at the measurement of like the community vitality and health, I mean, a lot of work is going in, in a very short period of time and a lot of discussion about future work is happening. Um, if I wanted to talk a little bit about what the focus of the 1.9 release was, it was largely on stability and targeted uh, graduation of particular features. Um, and I'll give a little bit more detail on that as we go through. Um, for folks who may not be aware, uh, the Kubernetes project is subdivided into a set of uh, special interest groups, which we call SIGs. And as well, there's some um, uh, working groups that kind of span SIGs. Um, that uh, a lot of the uh, discussion and development activities for the overall project come out of. Um, in particular, uh, I think when trying to get an accurate summary, there were about 18 top level features tracked in the release uh, that were produced uh, across all of those SIGs and working groups. And what I'm going to try to do today is give a little uh, color and commentary about uh, particular ones. Uh, generally speaking, uh, I think everyone across the Kubernetes community recognizes that Kubernetes is becoming uh, a central part of uh, folks' IT operations. And as a result, there's a strong need to make sure that stability uh, moving forward is, is paramount. So uh, there was a lot of focus in the uh, 1.9 release here to continue to focus on fixing bugs and ensuring uh, a stability, a stable platform uh, moving forward. Uh, in addition, I would say there was a bit of a slowdown on the community adding new alpha level features in favor of graduating things that had been alpha or that were in beta to a stable uh, status, um, uh, which I think is, is a sign of overall maturity happening within the project. And then uh, in addition, uh, this is important to me, particularly at Red Hat here, where we run very large uh, uh, clusters on our customers' behalf, um, is that a lot of the experience uh, that we get across the community about running clusters in production uh, is informing what we choose to fix and how we fix it uh, so that overall we can continue to refine, polish, uh, scale, and uh, improve the uh, supportability of the platform. So what I wanted to do to structure today's discussion was kind of give a summary overview of what uh, some of the, a subset of the 29 SIGs had produced in the 1.9 release and um, give a little detail on why some of that work is, is valuable. So uh, first, I'm going to kick off uh, SIG apps uh, graduated all of the workloads API to um, 
uh, our V1 status. So for folks who may not be aware, um, new API resource types in Kubernetes uh, go through a an alpha, beta, uh, and then ultimately a V1 or a promotion state. Uh, typically, uh, things start in alpha as they're being iterated and learned upon uh, beta when we think that they're starting to mature and we want to get uh, users to uh, actually take advantage of them. And when they get to V1, we really feel like they've reached a rock solid state uh, and it's uh, unlikely to change uh, uh, and will not change in a backwards and compatible fashion moving forward. So um, the key APIs that move forward were the daemon set, deployment, replica set, and stateful set. Uh, this was about a, let's say, a, a, it took over a year of effort to to reach this state, uh, and a lot, a lot of work was done to ensure that lessons learned from one workload controller were carried over to every other one, and a lot of work was done to ensure that uh, there was consistency across those controllers for how they manage resources. Um, uh, the batch work, workload APIs, in particular users who might be using jobs and cron jobs, uh, they're going to have a separate path to v1, but um, uh, I think it was a, a big win for the community generally to see the the four major workload types for stateless and stateful workloads have all now graduated to v1. Uh, so things to remember uh, if you're looking to migrate uh, your uh, existing content to the new resource types. Um, there were some changes uh, that were made to the workload API types as a part of their graduation to v1. Uh, in particular, um, any of the workload controllers, uh, the selectors that are used uh, to target pods that they manage. Um, there was some behavior in the past where the selector inside of your pod template uh, supported defaulting on what your controller managed. Uh, that, that was removed after a lot of lessons learned. Uh, and so in general, you have to give an explicit selector on your, your workload API type. Uh, in addition, uh, selectors are no longer mutable. Um, so we, the community kind of feels like there's better patterns around handling things like canaries and stuff. Uh, so that when you have a workload uh, type defined, whether it's a staple set or a deployment, uh, the set of pods that those things manage based on its selector are, are actually not mutable anymore. And in addition, all of the workload API types now support a common upgrade strategy for rolling update by default. Uh, for folks who have a large investment in the platform now, Obviously, uh, backwards compatibility is important uh, as, you know, this was a 16-month um, effort, essentially. Uh, so uh, if you are just starting to take advantage of uh, these workload APIs in a Kubernetes 1.9 plus timeframe, you know, we heavily encourage people to start using the apps v1 resource types. Uh, but if you have existing resources uh, that you've authored or you're managing, the platform will continue to support bi-directional auto-conversion with the older versions um, for an extended period of time. Uh, so that kind of was the major highlight out of SIG apps. I want to do a little bit of a deeper dive around uh, some of the great work that came out of uh, SIG API machinery. So, you know, if you think about what SIG API machinery produces, they do a lot of the, uh, I don't want to say plumbing, but they do a lot of the great work that supports extensibility to the platform. And one of the key areas that uh, really evolved this release was around emission control. So uh, for folks who may not be aware, uh, historically since Kubernetes 1.0, there was the ability to do something called static admission control. So you could write um, little code snippets uh, that intercepted uh, requests to the API server, and they were used to do defaulting and to do um, uh, resource constraints and things like quota. Um, and in the time frame now between cube 1.0 all the way up to now cube 1.9, you know, the number of emission controllers uh, kind of blossomed in the project and a lot of patterns were identified uh, that were common across uh, the ecosystem for the types of things that we saw emission controllers do. And I think uh, in cube 1.9, there was a, a great work to, to uh, clean up and uh, improve the extensibility story so that A, New users who want to go and intercept requests to do some custom action uh, don't need to get their code merged into the core Kubernetes repository. They can manage this uh, externally. Uh, and B, uh, the admission chain flow uh, was cleaned up to uh, address uh, recurring patterns we were seeing where uh, mutating and validating emission control handlers um, conflicted. 
So the good news here, what I want to talk about is uh, something called mutating and validating webhooks have uh, graduated to beta. And essentially, this means if you are interested in extending the platform to do things like, I want to intercept when a namespace is created so I can do something, or validate that these names conform to particular naming conventions, or for example, I want to intercept when a pod is created and maybe inject a, a common sidecar container. Um, in the past, these things were really hard to do because you had to get code into the core. Uh, now you can do these things using uh, what's called a, a mutating webhook, and you run a small server. Um, and there's examples that will be published out of the community on how to do this um, that uh, can run as a pod on the cluster. And anytime a request comes into the server, uh, you will get a call out in the particular chains called here, and you have the opportunity to have your external code mutate the incoming object prior to it being persisted as well as validate that object to enforce any constraints you need. Um, once the API server code pass starts calling out to external resources uh, prior to persistence, it's important to make sure that these things are low latency and performant uh, to support the community and their needs around uh, monitoring of this type of thing. Uh, there are Prometheus metrics now um, collected around uh, the latency of, of calling out to particular webhooks. Uh, and in particular, as I said, these, these, these webhooks can be managed outside of the cluster as well as being uh, managed uh, into the cluster uh, via a pod referred to by a service. So wh like, why is this important? Um, so folks may have heard about projects like Istio. Uh, and uh, uh, last I recall, Istio likes to inject a common sidecar container into every pod spec in order for the platform to work. Uh, similarly, the service catalog, you know, historically the service catalog wanted to be able to dynamically inject particular uh, MBARs into pods uh, on creation, and then there was work in the community around things like pod presets. And then uh, naturally OpenShift uh, is interested in intercepting uh, what happens in Kube, uh, Kubernetes uh, to perform its own constraints and, and validation needs. And so this uh, mutating webhook and validating webhook is really a big ecosystem enabler because it allows people to uh, intercept creation requests and do something in response without having to touch the core platform. Uh, on the right hand side here, you see a sample uh, webhook configuration. So these are stored in the uh, API server like any other uh, resource type. And basically what you can do is you can uh, set up a client configuration that says this is how you contact my uh, external webhook. And then you set up some rules that say, I want to intercept these particular operations on these particular resources. Uh, and if those rules match on an incoming request, you know, the server will call out to your, uh, your, your, your webhook. Uh, you have the opportunity to do some action, you know, uh, and say yay or nay if the request should proceed. Um, there are a failure policy that lets you control what happens uh, if your webhook admission server is unavailable, so you can fail open or fail closed. Uh, obviously, if you fail open, that would mean if, if the server can't find your external webhook, uh, it kind of just ignores it um, and couldn't give some, uh, I guess, non-deterministic behavior. But um, generally, you, you have the flexibility to say what you want to happen uh, when things can't be reached. Uh, I gave a link to a, a sample. Um, uh, a mission uh, webhook server that we at OpenShift have worked on that lets you control um, reservation of namespace names and encourage folks uh, who are interested in exploring that uh, to do their own enablement uh, uh, after the call. Uh, this is also particularly powerful if, if you're using things like custom resources. Uh, so a lot of people are using custom resources to uh, drive operator patterns and many folks wanted to intercept creation of custom resources to be able to perform an action. Um, this now kind of completes that vision, and uh, we look forward to getting a lot of feedback from the community about it. Uh, another great thing that came out of API Machinery, which I think we touched on in our last uh, community call around the 1.8 release, uh, is something called chunking, and basically this now graduated to beta. Uh, this is of particular importance to me as an operator of a very large uh, clusters in our online environments. Um, where previously when you would, you know, many of our controllers or our clients, whether you're doing migrations or not, uh, would commonly need to list all the resources. So if I just give an example of like some of our online deployments, which commonly have, you know, 10,000 namespaces and each namespace has nine secrets, 
Uh, it turns out listing 90,000 secrets is a really painful, slow uh, operation. Uh, so one of the, the great things that uh, is now possible is you can basically, uh, when you do a cube control get of, of this resource, uh, by default now it has a standard chunk size. So uh, it will fetch the resources in uh, groups of 500 by default so that end users see immediate responses and have a perceived uh, latency improvement, as well as the server is much more efficient at actually able being, uh, being able to return all these resources timely without reaching a timeout. So uh, this is one of those internal uh, density and scale improvements that might not get a lot of attention in blog posts, but are really critical to actually running reliable dense clusters or doing things like migration. So uh, this is uh, something I definitely want to highlight and I uh, think is a, is a big win for the community around reliability. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about from API Machinery is some of the work that was done around custom resources. So uh, for folks who are aware, uh, you can register your own uh, resource types that you want to manage uh, in Kubernetes. So uh, if you have your own third-party operator resource type that you want to be able to do CRUD on, uh, obviously you can do that now uh, in Kubernetes. But what you were not able to do previously was validate your resources prior to persistence. So a lot of people had to do uh, client-side validation, uh, which has its own pros and cons, but new in Kubernetes 1.9 uh, and on by default is uh, the ability when you declare your custom resource type to uh, give an optional open API v3 schema. And uh, when your custom resources are then created by end users, uh, they get validated against that schema and create an update calls. Um, so a quick example of this is on the right-hand side, you can see a custom resource definition uh, that has in its spec a new validation clause that says, okay, anything that's the uh, spec.version property on this resource must uh, uh, be one of these two values, as well as you know, the spec.replicas must be between you know, this value range. And so if we look at an example on the left, this is an example of that custom resource definition uh, in this case, it's a kind called app, uh, and it declares a version field and a replicas field that don't validate. Uh, and you get a really nice user experience now in Cube 1.9, where if a user posts what you see on the left, that gets validated on the API server uh, according to those validation rules. In this case, it's going to fail, and you get really rather nice um, validation error messages in response that lets users know why uh, something was or was not valid. I think this is one of those things that gets uh, uh, operators of the platform that want to go and extend and enable their own uh, tube style controllers, um, a level of power that they didn't have previously and, and kind of brings custom resources one cl step closer to having the same experience that you see in the native out of the box resources in Kubernetes. Uh, so I expect a, a lot of great uh, work will come out of this as a result. Uh, so moving on, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that came from SIG auth. So highlighting two particular items here. So there was work that happened around auditing um, to try to provide better clarity on actual timestamps when uh, logging audit events. So uh, there was some confusion in the past where if an audit event was recorded, uh, you didn't actually have two timestamps to know when the request was received versus where it was in the uh, uh, auditing stage uh, for processing that request. Uh, now there's particular timestamps that let you now track those two things clearly and kind of gives better granularity into your audit logs. Uh, and the other item I wanted to call out a little bit, uh, since this is useful for things like custom resources, is a new feature uh, in RBAC that lets you define cluster roles uh, that union together the role, the rules of other cluster roles. So for example, what you'll see here is created a cluster role called monitoring. And the aggregation rule says, I want you to match any cluster role that matches the aggregate to monitoring true label. And then there's a backend controller uh, in Kubernetes that then goes and says, we'll find all cluster roles that match that label and dynamically populate the rules for the monitoring role based on that. Um, so this is nice if you want to integrate your out-of-the-box uh, role types, like default, edit, and view, uh, with uh, any custom resources you create. Um, uh, 
so I thought that was useful to call out. Next up, out of uh, SIG CLI, this is one of those features that I really like. Uh, I uh, have a long history with the project. I believe I, I tried to get this feature in originally in 2015, um, and it's taken some time. Uh, but uh, I was really happy to see that this landed, which is you can now use field selectors in uh, cube control. So folks may not have been aware, but in the underlying API, you could pass field selectors to kind of restrict the set of uh, resources that came back. And this was really common when um, implementing certain controllers or even when it's doing things like in the kubelet where you want to find all pods that were bound to your node. Um, you can now basically reproduce everything you could do in the API via cube control nicely using the field selector syntax. So for example, if you've ever struggled to get, uh, how do I find all node, all pods scheduled to a particular node in a one line script command? You know, that's now possible here where you just have the filter pods on spec.node name or you want to find all pods that were running, all pods that were not running. If you want to filter events, you know, based on their source, uh, basically you have a lot more flexibility now uh, in cube control uh, to do things based on the actual field values uh, versus just things like labels. Um, inherently, uh, field selectors, you know, you have to know which field selection clauses are available for that resource type. Um, but I, I think generally speaking, this is a, a, a really useful big win. And if you, it'll avoid people having to write a lot of uh, JQ type uh, filtering semantics that we had seen in the past. Uh, I want to very quickly go over what was going on across some of the SIGs that deal with our cloud providers. Um, so in the AWS SIG, uh, some work was done to support uh, C5 instance types that use NVMe uh, device volumes. Um, in addition, uh, nodes that uh, present themselves as having EBS volumes that are stuck attaching are now uh, automatically tainted. Um, and the expectation is that operators will now monitor for that taint and remedy as they see appropriate. So that might mean if you, if you see a node has been tainted uh, because it has volume stuck attaching, you might you know, um, uh, just choose to restart that node, for example. Um, in addition, on Azure, there was some work to improve the load balancer implementation and just general stability. And on OpenStack, uh, a number of um, uh, iterations were done to improve what, how it integrated with block storage uh, and the load balancer. On the networking side, a um, couple items I'll discuss here for networking. So alpha support was added for IPv6. Um, and in addition, uh, I believe in the last uh, update call from Cube 1.8, we talked about there was alpha support for uh, Cube Proxy now supporting IPVS instead of just IP tables. Uh, this is now graduated to beta in the Cube 1.9 release, and we're excited to see um, the outcomes of that uh, as people start to evaluate it. Um, there were a lot of potential uh, reported benefits that you know we need to measure uh, in our dense clusters ourselves to see uh, the pros and cons of the change. But uh, generally speaking, IPBS has a lot of potential long-term benefits for improving your performance on dense clusters where you have a large number of services, where writing things like IP tables rules was very slow, or even evaluating those chains was slow. Uh, in addition, uh, potentially offers us more load balancing algorithms for how we choose to uh, route, and some improvements around health checks and, and connection retries. Uh, moving on to uh, SIG node, uh, there was, generally speaking, a, a lot of performance and re reliability improvements um, that were done in Cube 1.9 to just make sure that the kubelet is more stable uh, at running your workload. Um, across the container runtime ecosystem, uh, I think we're starting to see all the work that was done around the container runtime interface uh, in SIG node come to fruition. So I uh, wanted to highlight uh, the great work that was done out of Red Hat and uh, Intel and others for Cryo getting moved to stable. Um, and so it passes all of the uh, EDE tests for Cube 1.9 uh, and it has uh, integration with Minikube and we encourage everyone to try it out. Um, in addition, the other runtimes uh, have evolved in the ecosystem. So Containerd moved to beta uh, as well as the others enlisted here. Um, generally speaking, this, this is really uh, important to me because you know, and this is probably the first release where it was really true that uh, 
the idea of being able to plug and play particular container runtimes uh, has has come to fruition. And now you get to evaluate the runtime you want to run based on you know uh, performance metrics, stability, uh, those types of things. Um, in particular, here at Red Hat, we will be looking to deploy Cryo out to our uh, OpenShift Online clusters um, very shortly. Uh, so for uh, the debugging tools, a lot of uh, to make it easier to debug environments when you're using a variety of container runtime choices, uh, there is a new effort for CRI tools uh, that has improved to basically make you uh, be able to introspect what's happening in the machine independent of the container runtime. Uh, in the resource management space, uh, a lot of work was done to just kind of continue to iterate and prepare for graduating features we've been doing for a while. Uh, so uh, for device plugins, uh, a lot of work was done to just kind of improve the reliability of how the Kubelet interacts with device plugins. At this point, we still only have a, a limited set of plugins uh, available in the community, largely focused around a GPU accelerator use case. Uh, but if folks are interested in uh, participating, and integrating with other plugin types, I think we'd love a contribution. Uh, in addition, uh, for workloads that uh, CPU latency sensitive needs, um, we continue to iterate uh, our, what's called our CPU manager or pinning policy. Uh, and so the static CPU pinning policy that says if you uh, request a core, you get an exclusive core and you'll have that core for the life of your pod. Uh, Stability work was done to ensure that that works across uh, Kubelet restarts. And basically at this point, I think we're at a good state to graduate uh, that work in a future release. Uh, and in addition, huge pages for folks who are managing large databases or, or caches, uh, based on some experience of, of using what was done previously, uh, we eliminated it from being tied to the, the Quas model, but it, um, uh, basically that's another thing that we're preparing to be able to graduate to beta in the future. On the node side, it's important that you know how your workloads are running. Uh, so there were a number of numerous metrics improvements done. So uh, as folks uh, may be aware, the Kubelet embeds a component called C Advisor. Uh, so C Advisor got uh, extended to add support for accelerator stats. So uh, the node now can report the make model, how much memory your GPU has, how much memory that GPU is using and how utilized uh, that GPU is. And so this is just an example of something we see as being important uh, prerequisite to be able to graduating things like device plugins. Uh, in addition, ephemeral pod storage is an activity that's been going on for a while uh, in the community that lets you control how much local disk um, pods can consume. Uh, right now we have monitoring and, uh, and metrics data now reported to say how much uh, local storage is being used. And in addition, for folks who uh, integrate with the Kubelet Summary API for metrics collection, in the past, we've just reported stats uh, that were container only, uh, but now we give pod level usage stats, um, which lets you know uh, if that pod has multiple containers very easily how much memory you see. Uh, I don't know who the noise is. I, I, I think I've solved it. Here it comes again. Anybody is unmuted? Perhaps. At all. All right, Derek, try it again. All right. All right, so moving on, uh, there's a resource management work group, which is an effort across SIG scheduling and Node and a variety of others. Uh, another particular item I wanted to highlight here was um, enhancements to quota. Uh, so uh, this was another one of those things that came out of just the observability of running really large clusters and unique challenges you run into uh, when you want to preserve the amount of etcd uh, space that's used. Uh, so the major improvement that came into quota in this release is that you can now uh, do object count quota on all standard namespace resource types. Uh, so there's a syntax for this now where you can just say count 
uh, and the resource name and the group they're in. Um, and in addition, you can also now uh, quote a huge pages. So that was another prepare, preparatory work item done to support graduating that to beta in a future release. So a quick example here is if you are wanting to control the number of pods that a user can consume, and in addition, the number of jobs that they can spawn, uh, this is the example of the new syntax that lets you basically uh, quota any standard uh, resource type in, in Kubernetes. Um, so this is uh, really nice to see. In the future, we expect to be able to quota um, custom resource types as well. Uh, we just did not get to that point yet. Um, okay, so six scheduling. Uh, there were more iterative improvements in pod priority and preemption. Uh, so new in Cube 1.9, uh, the pod priority feature, which is still in alpha, uh, is now respecting pod disruption budgets. Uh, in addition, it's integrating properly with the Kubelet eviction logic. So folks who may not have been aware, uh, pod priority is basically a mechanism that lets you say, um, you associate a priority uh, integer to each pod and uh, items with higher priority are giving better guarantees towards scheduling. And if that resource, that pod can't be scheduled, uh, it will preempt pods with a lower priority to ensure that there's a fit. Um, so this introduced some unique uh, challenges when trying to integrate with how the Qubit itself chooses to evict resources, uh, which in the past has always been when pods are using more than they asked for and resources are scarce. Uh, the new uh, logic is basically you continue to be at, at danger if you use more than you requested, uh, but uh, Assuming there are no pods that are using more than requested, uh, it then will break ties with priority and then work against uh, whoever the largest consumer resource is relative to the request. Um, in addition, some interesting work that some uh, of our team members here at Red Hat have doing was we added a new priority function. Uh, I believe it's alpha that lets you, um, for folks who are aware, when a pod has a CPU request and a, a CPU limit, uh, right now, the scheduler had only satisfied resource requests, and it didn't really care what your limit was. Uh, we had gotten a lot of feedback that uh, users wanted to prefer pods whose limits could be satisfied so that you could reach your maximum burst. And so uh, this is a new priority function that was added that is a useful tiebreaker. So that says uh, the scheduler will prefer to land your pod on a node that can satisfy both your request and your maximum burst uh, limit. One other thing I know here I wanted to call out here was there's some work going on in SIG scheduling around various incubator projects. Uh, one of those items is the descheduler, uh, which is basically looking to um, uh, look at an existing set of uh, pods that have been scheduled across your cluster and perform for better or for worse, you know, a defrag and see if there's a better home for that pod now, and if so, look to move it. Um, this is a, an incubator work uh, that's continuing to evolve uh, in the community. Uh, and SIG storage, a um, few items I'll call out, a lot of them are all alpha. Um, the first is for folks who are aware when Kubernetes wanted to support new volume plugins, uh, you always had to get code in core Kubernetes. So it was kind of a similar problem as the emission control problem I talked about previously. And that's a bit of a hindrance uh, towards uh, uh, broadening the ecosystem uh, because of a few reasons. One, it makes your integration have to be open source and some folks uh, had trouble with that too. Uh, it's just hard to get your code into Cube sometimes. Uh, and so there was a great effort uh, done for around something called the container storage interface, which defined a common uh, API pattern across uh, multiple uh, container orchestrators. So this was an effort across the Kubernetes community, the Mesos community, Cloud Foundry, um, Docker Swarm. And basically a new volume plugin was written for Kubernetes core uh, that is currently in alpha that knows how to uh, interface against the container storage interface definition. And in the long term, this will allow you to enable volume plugins that can be deployed uh, containerized on the cluster uh, and not need to be into core Kubernetes itself. Uh, in addition, uh, alpha support for raw block devices was added, uh, and there's one implementation today in the community. I expect that to grow in the future. Uh, and then finally, I think we talked about in Cube 1.8, there was an initial support to allow you to resize your provisioned uh, volumes. 
Uh, that resize support uh, got extended uh, to additional volume types. So new in Q19, uh, you can resize your GCE persistent disks, your Ceph uh, disks, your uh, AWS CBS volumes, and your Cinder-backed uh, persistent volume claims. Uh, so I expect, based on the experience of, of that uh, growing with multiple um, uh, storage volume types, that that will be set up to go to beta in a future release. Uh, the last item I want to highlight was some work that came out of SIG Windows. Um, so new in Cube 1.9, the Kubelet and Cube Proxy uh, can run on a Windows Server 2016 plus release. Um, and what this will let you do is have Windows-based uh, nodes in your cluster. Your control plane components still run on Linux. Uh, some work was done at SIG Windows to try to further evolve or improve uh, the support of running pods on Windows nodes. So listed a, a number of them here. Uh, but at this point, basically, I think uh, SIG Windows and the broader community is wanting everyone to evaluate its usage and provide feedback to the community on how to further uh, iterate. But this is a, a heartening sign to see where uh, the set of workload types that are supported on Kubernetes continues to grow, not just on Linux itself, but across the broader uh, operating system ecosystem. So that's uh, Cube 1.9 uh, in an, uh, a nutshell. Let's look forward a little bit for Cube 1.10, and then we can take Q&A. So Cube 1.10 is, is very early. Uh, so after Cube 1.9 went out the door, as you can imagine, everyone took a very well-deserved long vacation. And Cube 1.10 planning is just uh, starting uh, across a variety of our SIGs. Um, so what I wanted to highlight here was a couple items that you know uh, I, I personally hope to see continue to get attention. Uh, but you know this is a bit early days and subject obviously to change. Uh, I expect continuing moving forward, stability and bug fixes will continue to be a recurring theme. Uh, we talked about everything being extensible in uh, uh, across the Kubernetes platform. So whether that's container runtimes, that was uh, API machinery extension hooks, custom resources. Uh, storage volume types, uh, device plugins. Uh, along those themes of not needing to get something into core cube to take advantage of it, I expect all those extensibility um, uh, vectors to continue to evolve. As well, um, as more and more clusters are run at greater and greater densities, you know, we should continue to see um, improved uh, scaling uh, improvements. Uh, some of the items listed here uh, that are of interest to me, as I noted earlier, the descheduler component uh, is an incubator project that's being worked on uh, in Kubernetes today and um, is probably going to be looking to get some more uh, actual real-world feedback uh, post Cube 110. Uh, the priority and preemption features, I'd love to see those get graduated uh, to beta, as well as a number of the other things that were discussed previously. And um, uh, for folks on the call, if there are particular features that you would love to see uh, Kubernetes start to explore as well. The community is very open to input. I would encourage you to uh, attend the appropriate SIG and, and let its leadership know what you had in mind, um, because that, that ultimately makes the project better for everyone. So with that in mind, I will open the floor for any questions. And uh, All right, thank folks. You um, <laughs> thanks, Derek. That was, uh, in a nutshell, um, a lot of work went on to get Kubernetes 1.9 out the door, and um, yes, everyone deserved that wonderful vacation break, and uh, hopefully are back and reinvigorated for 1.10. Um, if you have questions, ask them in the chat. If not, because um, I'm not seeing any questions, which probably means you've stunned them um, <laughs> into silence with all of those features, and you can reach us on the Slack channel or in the Kubernetes community channels. Um, and get answers there. And as, as Derek pointed out, he's also um, Derek Wayne Carr on Twitter, but you probably know him on GitHub as well. So please feel free to reach out to him or to ask questions on the OpenShift Commons mailing list. And if you're not on that list yet, um, send an email to me or um, tweet me on the at OpenShift Commons um, Twitter handle and I will get you set up there. Um, it's going to be an interesting year, 2018. Lots of good stuff coming down the pike um, for Kubernetes and all of the ancillary upstream projects that are related to it. So if there's topics that you're interested in hearing about Kubernetes related, um, upstream or other uh, workload stuff, please um, let me know. 
and I'll be happy to um, organize, recruit speakers, um, and to get folks um, generally the information they need as quickly as possible. So again, I'm not seeing any questions, Derek, which means you've probably done an awesome job here um, or stunned everybody. And um, I really thank you for taking the time today to listen in on this. Um, it's a rather large audience, so um, we're pleased with that. So um, thank you. Um, all this, uh, the slides for this and the video should be up um, by Monday morning on blog.openshift.com. And um, we'll look forward to um, hearing more from everybody. Uh, so thanks again, Derek. Thank you, Diane.